Hi, my name is Kristen and this is Kristen Craze Books. So I know I'm wearing the same outfit as in my last video, but I just didn't have time to change and all that. I need to get this video filmed because I'm going out of town, but I needed to take the chance to talk about all of the books that I read in June because they were some interesting ones. And I was the co-host for Once Upon a Readathon Treasure Island Edition for Team Jen. So I read quite a few Jen books I want to talk about and then some other things as well. And I did feel a little burnout by the end, but it was all worth it because I had such a good time and I got to read some books I don't think I would have prioritized anytime soon, so that is always a good thing. And I'm going to talk about these in order from my least favorite to my favorite, and I'm going to start with the two DNFs I had this month. So the two DNFs I had, they are both contemporary romance, so that makes me wonder if I maybe just wasn't in the mood for that in June, but I don't know. One was really anticipated for, for me, and one I had a feeling might not work, so we'll start with that one first, and that is Happy Place by Emily Henry. I read Book Lovers last year and really didn't like it, so I figured I would try Happy Place because I liked the setup of it and it sounded interesting and this would be my make or break for Emily Henry and sadly I just couldn't push through. There's something about her characters that I just don't connect with and that's the number one thing that I need in a romance. I wanted to root for these characters and I just couldn't see a scenario where I would want them to be together. And this has me questioning whether or not I like second chance romance. I think that I have a couple of exceptions where I do, but this setup where we're in split timelines, we see them when they got together and then we're in the present when they're not. I think maybe it's just overdone for me and it's predictable and I just don't have that great of a time with it anymore. And when you're seeing why they broke up, it's hard for you to want them to be together. So that's just the experience I had with this. I just struggle to connect. So. That's just something Emily, Henry, and I, we don't click. So that's just me. I know a lot of people love this one, and then some people don't. I don't know what it is about Emily, Henry, and if some people have, like, two favorites, and then they don't like these two, I don't know. And I, I know she'll come out with one next year, and I'll be tempted by it again. So remind me not to do that. Because I pushed through Book Lovers, and I almost pushed through this one as well, and I just stopped myself. I said, why are you doing this to yourself? So I quit it. And then the next one is more disappointing because I actually did love last year's book by this author and I'm just contradicting everything I said about Happy Place because it was a second chance romance with two timelines and it was messy and that was Every Summer After by Carly Fortune so I was really excited to read Meet Me at the Lake but I couldn't. It had tropes in it that I cannot stand, that would be spoilery, but it's a love to the max. You're throwing your whole life away for a guy you met for one day. I just, the whole thing was too much for me. And I think that the, and I think that her debut, uh, it was refreshing for me because it was set on a lake in Canada and I really just relied on the nostalgia of it for me. But this one, that didn't even save it. I struggled with it quite a bit. So I had to let that one go as well. And now moving on to the books that I actually completed. The first one is Assault Grows Heavy by Cassandra Koff. I don't know what to make of this book. I think it's like 97 pages, but it felt like 400 for me. And I don't know why. I had to keep going back and re-listening to parts. I think maybe the audiobook wasn't the right decision for this one, but that's what I had access to. And I can't even really tell you what it's about. It's one of the most confusing books I have read in a long, long time. And it is kind of, is it a romance between a mermaid and a plague doctor? I thought that dynamic was interesting. Why would a, a mermaid and a plague doctor even know each other? We don't know. You were plopped into the middle of this story. It feels like you're just in the middle of a scene of a movie and you have no idea what's going on. You can't get your bearings. You're just expected to grasp everything. And I spent the whole time confused. Like, where are they going? How do these two know each other? What's happening here? And yeah, I struggled with it. But I can't deny that it was beautifully written, if not a little bit overwrought. I was like looking up words on the dictionary all the time and things like that. And yeah, I don't know. I just don't think I got it. And that's okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if you were supposed to get it. So I don't know. But there were some beautiful moments in there. I really did think that the mermaid character was interesting. If you're not into gore, like body gore, I'd skip this one. There were some shocking scenes, which I kind of liked. But overall, just confusing mess. For me so I don't know if I would try more from Cassandra Ka because I know her last book people really didn't like but I'm intrigued enough by her writing and just her mind that I might give something of hers a chance in the future. Next is one I finished this morning. 
June 30th. I got this in just in time. And this is This Woven Kingdom by Tara Moffey. And I liked this, but I think when I'm comparing it to all the gin books that I read this month, it just doesn't hold up. And I think maybe that's just because it was more focused on the romance than I was expecting. And I noticed while reading all these gin books, I thought that I would get burnt out on them, and I haven't. They are all very unique despite having similar settings and kind of relying on similar myths and folklore and things like that. But they all take them to completely different places and I so appreciated that and that is but it feels like a familiar setup in YA fantasy where we have a prince who is kind of defying his family and what is expected of him and falls for somebody who is of lower status who happens to be like a lost heir of some kind and she in this case she happens to be a djinn. So I thought that was interesting, that twist where she's a djinn and you're learning about what she's capable of because she's a djinn and how she ended up in the place that she is. So her POV, I loved. His POV just felt very familiar to me and very insta-love and too swoony and too whiny for my taste, but I thought she was interesting. But then the second half gets so much about the romance and I'm like, why are these two having such a great connection all of a sudden and like they're willing to throw their entire lives away, betray? He's willing to betray his family for her, this person that he saw from a distance. Went to, I don't know, I just couldn't get over that part. So I thought, okay, I don't think I'll continue on with this series. And then the last 5% happens, we're introduced to something and I'm, it got me. So I will be reading the sequel. I gave this three stars, but I think there's potential for this series to go to some really interesting places. So in the end, I enjoyed it and I will continue on with the series. Next up is another gin book, and this is like a novelette. It's so short, but this is A Dead Gin in Caro by P. Jelly Clark. This is the first pe prequel in the Dead Gin universe. So the first full no length novel in that series is A Master of Gin, which I'm sure you've seen around and eventually I will get to. I just want to read all the little books that lead up to that because I've heard they're worth it and I do think that this one was worth it. It's pretty much a police procedural set in a steampunk Cairo in 1912. And at the beginning, I Jin is found dead and they're trying to figure out who did it and that's all I'm gonna say about it that's all you need to know but it reaffirmed for me after reading Ring Shout that I really do like something about P. Jelly Clark's writing there's something special there so yeah that was good I feel like I always show you my other cat in all my videos and I never show you this guy I have two cats this is coffee oh he's gonna kiss my face isn't he sweet he normally doesn't like when I film because he is scared of the ring light for some reason but he came out today look at him He's so cute. So I'll put him down because he's distracting me, but he's such a sweet boy. Okay, let's continue. So the next I have is the one contemporary romance that I managed to actually finish in June, which is so odd because normally that's what I crave. But this is That Summer Feeling by Bridget Morrissey. This was insta-love, but I could look past it because I feel like that happens at a summer camp. This takes place in an adult summer camp. Our main character, Garland, is going through a divorce. Her husband broke up with her on Valentine's Day and she is working for Uber. And then one of her passengers happens to invite her to participate in this adult summer camp. And she goes for it. And she finds romance with a woman who happens to be her bunkmate at the summer camp. It takes place over the course of a week. So obviously the romance happens really quickly, but I feel like if you ever been to summer camp like that's the vibe of a summer camp you kind of let your inhibitions go and you're more open to things so, so I don't know it didn't bother me as much as it did in some other books I read this month so I just embraced it this was corny it was cheesy I ate it up it's not a perfect book by any stretch of the imagination but I had a good time with it it's a perfect summer read I will say the one thing that I thought was weird is there's a, like a light fantasy element to it where at the beginning of the book like at a prologue she is on the way to her honeymoon she loses a bracelet this man at the airport picks up the bracelet and she has like a premonition where in the future they are together and then this man happens to be at this adult summer camp and is the brother to the woman that she ends up having a romance with so that little light fantasy element i don't think was needed i guess it was used to add some tension or something and i guess the first half of it it is really her trying to pursue this guy and her bunkmates trying to set them up as well. When I talked about this book in a past video, I said I was hoping it would have all the fun camping vibes where you're playing games and stuff and it had that in spades. This is like a competition and 
the love interest is so competitive so you get all that stuff and you see her character overcome some fears she's got a fear of heights all this kind of stuff it was just a good time and it made me want to go to adult summer camp i wonder if that's really a thing because i would be down to give that a try next we have a graphic novel this was the one that i started the readathon with it was fantastic it's available on kindle unlimited this is aquacorn cove by k o'neill who wrote the tea dragon society books that i see everywhere so i need to give those a try because this is my first graphic novel from them and i loved it and because it's a graphic novel i don't want to say too much about it other than it really explores grief and the loss of a parent so i think you need to know that going in because it made me emotional i teared up because i just wasn't prepared for it and it also talks about in the environment and the impact that humans have on the oceans so that is all I will say on that one. It was really beautiful. You can read it in 15 minutes and it's worth it. I think you're going to be shocked by this one because it's not something I would ever, ever read on my own. But this is Obsession by Kay Lorraine and Meg Ann and I will take no questions at this time. I am doing a read along with Maggie from Maggie's Books and Stuff and Hannah from Hannah Blackwell. They started a Discord where really they're talking about fantasy romances mostly but it's really opened up to all genres and one of the things Maggie is doing on there is a read-along of uh, the Make Game series where every two weeks we are reading it together on the live and I actually join them on the live so I will link that down below if you want to hear my thoughts on the first maybe 30% of the first book obsession and how much fun it was and I think it was fun because I was reading with other people and Maggie prepared me for what to expect with this you can't take it seriously it's cringy it has some of the most hilarious one liners I've ever read. I haven't laughed out loud in a book in such a long time and I did with this one so it was everything that Maggie told me it was going to be and I was prepared for that and she said it's like a paranormal Hogwarts, supernatural Hogwarts and that's what it is. This girl she is a werewolf and she's unable to shift and she ends up at this boarding school where everybody is hot and into her. So it's reverse harem white shoes, which is not something I've ever read or ever even thought about reading, but God, is this fun. I'm having so much fun. So each book follows a different guy that she's interested in. The first one, he is a vampire prince. Then we have a fellow werewolf who happens to be her mate, but she rejected him. A demigod, who is pretty much Thor. And then a priest, randomly, this priest. So listen to the audiobook. The audiobook of this they put some money into this. It is full cast and one of those full casts where it's like a duet. So even when you're in a chapter of where she is in POV, if there's a line spoken by one of the guys, that narrator comes in and says it. And I love that. I ate this up. We all devoured this in a day because you just can't stop. It is that addicting and silly and fun and has so many strange references. Obviously Marvel references, but it was just so much fun and what I needed. So I will be continuing on this, with this series. We are reading a different book in the series every two weeks and I'm here for it. And then to do a complete 180 from that, I have the book that we read for the Book Checkout Book Club and that was Redemption Indigo by Karen Lord. I had no idea what to expect from this because it was not a book I'd ever heard of before it was chosen for this and I thought it was really interesting. It does something different from any other book I have ever read before which is kind of hard to find. It's one of those things where I think it's hard to even talk about a book that you can compare it to. The closest would be what Maria said and that is The Empress of Salt and Fortune, that series by Nevo, where the narrator is a character and it starts with them saying let me tell you a story and then you get told this fable and it follows what you would expect from a fable because there's a very on the nose moral but I liked that about it and there's like a dreamlike quality to it I don't know how to explain it you just kind of have to experience it and this is another one I think if you're able to to listen to the audiobook because it's almost like oral storytelling like you're sitting around a fire somewhere and an elder is telling you a story and you're supposed to take something away from it and I think it's best to go into it knowing as little as possible but yeah, it was just, there's something really beautiful about it. It's not one where you're going to fall in love with the characters necessarily, or there's that much of a plot. I don't think it was the perfect book for a book club because there's not that much to discuss, but it was our most successful book for the book club because we all appreciated what it was doing and it did what it wanted to do really well. Finally, we have one that I actually own. I realized I am doing a terrible job about reading what I own, but we have The Stardust Thief by Chelsea Abdullah. I buddy read this with Becky and we had a good time. I think 
we ended up both giving this four stars. I think I liked it more straight away and it had to, she had to warm up to it. But in the end, we both appreciated it. Again, another gin book that is doing something unique. I think that I did myself a service by waiting a year to read this because when this came out, a lot of people were reading it and were disappointed in it. So I had a year to adjust my expectations and to know what to expect because this is technically adult, but it leans YA in kind of the tone. So I knew that going in, I was prepared for it and I allowed myself to be surprised by it. And of all the ones that I have read this month, I think this is the one that feels the most inspired by 1001 Nights and I like that about it. We have a magical lamp and everything like that. And again, this is that setup where there is a prince who is betraying his family and has a connection with a female character who, in this case, she is like, what do they call her? The Midnight Merchant? Yeah. So she is kind of a thief in this one. And she is now being tasked with stealing this magical lamp for the king. And they end up on this adventure together. And this whole time you think that maybe it's going to be a romance, but it's not a romance, at least not in this worst book, which I actually liked. We do get a third POV who I won't really talk about, but I didn't quite understand why they were there or why that was necessary, but I'm thinking that we will le learn more about that in the next book. This ended on a bit of a cliffhanger, but it was satisfying enough. The last 25%, it was all like a whirlwind. Actually, the last half is action, action, action. The first part is a lot of setup, getting to know these characters, which I actually appreciated. I like a setup. And then the second half, it flips, and it's a lot of action. But it did some really interesting things in terms of what you might expect from a gin book and desert fantasy. I was worried that this was going to become a quest story, but it never felt that way. It never felt tedious or like we were following the characters on a journey. There was enough going on. There were moments that were shocking. I almost got emotional at one point. So yeah, I thought that this was really kind of good. And I, again, I don't think it's perfect. I think there's some pacing issues in terms of the tone. It's really, you have to adjust because it starts off slow and then really action-packed after that. And the characters aren't the most memorable, but I think it's going to some interesting places. In the end, I predicted some of it, but not to the extreme that we got. So the sequel comes out this year and I will be reading that. And then the best gin book I read in June will come as no surprise, because I think that when you think of a gin book, this is the one that is most beloved and the most recommended. This is The City of Brass by S.A. Charcobordi. And I was nervous to read this because I saw TNF Amina, The Adventures of Amina El Serafi. But this, it tonally is so different and I liked that. This is slower, it's a little bit darker. It's kind of beautiful in a way. And it does take a different look at gin than the other ones that I read. And once again, it has that setup where there's like a prince character who is defying his family, but in this way, it's different. This character is quite different from the other ones I read. And yeah, what to say about this? I didn't love that character for a long, long time, but he's growing on me and I understand why he is the way he is. We get a different romance in here that I was emotionally invested in. The ending of this shook me to my core and was devastating and I need to get to the sequel already. I am in the middle of so many gin series now. I don't know what I did to myself in June, but I appreciate it because I love gin books. And of all the gin books, I keep repeating, how many times can I say gin in this video? But of all of them that I read this month, I think Nari is my favorite character. There's something special about her and the connections that she makes in this. And she ends up accidentally summoning a gin and then realizes something about her past that she did not know before. And yeah, that's all I'm going to say about it. I've heard that the series just gets better from here, which I can see because I, the first half of this, like I said this about the Stardust Thief, but it's even more true in this one. The first half of this is set up, but I appreciated all that setup because I think we needed it. And a lot of the times in some fantasies that I read, I feel disoriented and I didn't feel that way in this one. I understood what was going on. I could picture it all beautifully. The character connections and motivations all made sense to me and I think that this is going to go to a really interesting place and I can't wait for that. I have a feeling this will be a top series for me and yeah, I can't believe I put it off for this long. So the last one, it's either my favorite or it's tied with City of Brass. It's hard to choose. It's You can't compare the two, but this is Claws and Contrivances by Stephanie Burgess. 
This is the second book in the Regency Dragon series and I was sent an eARC from the author because she must have seen one of my videos or a blog post or something where I talked about Scales and Sensibility, the first book, because it was part of the Spiffbo finalists last year and I read all the finalists and it was one of my favorites. So she reached out, she sent me an eARC and I dropped everything I was doing to read it. I was in the middle of some other books and I'm like, no, I need this right now. This is Regency Romance, reads like Jane Austen with dragons. That's all you need to know. This one I think kind of leans towards Northanger Abbey because one of the cousins in here is really obsessed with gothic fiction and I know that's a big theme in Northanger Abbey so that's the vibes I was getting from this. And in this series each of the books follows a different sister. So in this one we're following Rose. Their parents died in a tragic accident. We found that out in the first book. And all the sisters are sent to live with distant relatives and in this one Rose is living with distant cousins. And they're so sweet. In the first book, the family that she ends up with, not sweet, but Rose lucked out. They're not wealthy by any means. The house is crumbling, but they adore her and support her. And she ends up finding a dragon there. And then they have an extra neighbor who is kind of sketchy. And then there's a dragon researcher who's coming to visit her uncle. It's all very convoluted, but she ends up in this fake dating situation and I loved it. And I loved the dragons. I loved Rose as a character. I loved all of the cousins who supported her, her aunt and uncle. The love interest was really sweet and kind of nerdy and I just kind of adored him. So the whole thing was just so much fun for me. So if you liked the first one, I think you're going to like this one. I think I might have liked it even a touch more because I think Stephanie Burgess really found the tone that she wanted for this and it's so good. So in the society, I think I didn't mention this, that the dragons in this, they're small. They're used as like a status symbol. Ladies in high society wear them on their shoulders. That's what the dragons are for. They apparently have no magical powers. So it's just for status and they're so sweet. I just love that. I just love this series. I haven't heard anything about a book three, but the book two is not even out yet and I'm anxiously awaiting book three. Yeah, so that's it. It was a good reading month. Not as many books as I wanted to read for the readathon, but some real highlights in there. It just solidified that I love gin books. I don't need to start any more gin books. I need to catch up on all of these series first before I do that. But yeah, I loved it. So let me know if you've read any of these, what your thoughts on them were. What was the best book you read in June? I would love to know. So thank you again for your support. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.